Hi, everyone. So in the Dask survey, uh, a common response was people wanted to have more intermediate or advanced level learning uh, techniques. So in this example, we'll look at a problem that occurred over the last week in GitHub, and then we'll look at a few different advanced Dask techniques to work around that problem. Uh, this problem may look familiar to you, but even if it doesn't, I think some of the, the techniques we, we use will be interesting for you. So the problem we're looking at uh, is this one. Uh, someone presented with the problem that the Dask scheduler was not distributing tasks evenly. And so uh, they're saying, look, the number of tasks in this worker is 15. All the other workers are, are, not, are not doing anything. Uh, Florian, who responded to this question, correctly pointed out that this line is red because uh, we haven't heard from this worker in a couple of hours, actually. So the worker is still alive. All the network connections are still active. Uh, but uh, the worker hasn't responded to us in a while. Uh, that's odd. Uh, and it turns out that that's not surprising to the user because uh, they're using a technology uh, called OR tools, which is a sort of a classic optimization technology suite. Uh, uh, Garobi, CoinOR, these are all sort of tools in a similar event. And, and this tool uh, isn't releasing the gill, and it can run uh, several minutes. So this tool is, is grabbing onto Python, running its own code, and not letting go. And that results in a common error message. Uh, this one, event loop was unresponsive for some amount of time. If you've used DAS for long enough, you've probably seen this error message here. So in this little presentation, we're going to go through what's happening and try to give some intuition for what's happening under the hood and then give you some techniques to work around this particular problem. So as a quick reminder, a Dask cluster has a client where we run code, a scheduler, which is telling all the workers what to do, and a bunch of workers, which are running user code. And we're really going to dig into what that user code uh, does and how that can affect and interact with how Dask code runs. So zooming in a little bit on one of those workers, sort of zoomed in here, a DAS worker process is a single process that contains a few things. It contains DAS code, which is handling all the network connections to, to other uh, players in the DAS cluster. It includes a bunch of Python data. This is you know, usually a bunch of pandas data frames, some NumPy, some NumPy arrays. In this user's case, maybe uh, an OR tools uh, optimization model, or might be a scikit-learn image, or a, any other Python object you might have. And that data and the Dask code are living in the same process. That's really nice because Dask can look at that data and can tell you what's going on. And then there's also a thread pool executor. So this is a, a pool of threads, often you know, four threads or maybe 20 threads if you have a large machine. And this thread pool is running your code. It's running a user code. And this is actually really powerful to have the user code and the Dask code and all the data be all in the same process, all in this shared memory environment. That means that transfer costs are really low. It also means that we can look and inspect your code and run profiling. It's great most of the time. Uh, you can contrast this with uh, the sort of the classic PySpark diagram, where you've got some JVM systems like this Spark worker and a bunch of Python code in these little white boxes. And they have to communicate over some pipe. So there's some separation between the control system Spark and where your code runs Python. This can make things more stable, as we'll find out in a moment, but also introduces a lot of complexity, which can really get in the way of usability. So in general, in Dask, we've chosen a different architecture where everything is in the same process. And that's been, that's been good in the common case for us. But as we'll see, sometimes it's bad, and that's what this user is running into. So what's happening in, in their case is that their code is, is bad in some way. In this case, it's running some function and locking up the entire process for several minutes. That means that the Dask code can't can't do anything, right? It's, it's, it's as though this entire process has just sort of gone away to the rest of the Dask cluster. And Dask is unable to do things like load balancing, which is what this user is running into. So let's let's see an example of that in a slightly simplified form uh, by playing around with some, some code here. So I've set up a Dask uh, cluster, just my local machine, and I've simulated uh, a little data processing pipeline here. I'm going to load some data. I'm going to pre-process that data. And then they're going to run some scary function. I'm kind of simulating what they were running with this optimization thing here. This scary function is a little bit different. Every once in a while, about 40% of the time, it's just going to crash the process that it's in. And the rest of the time, it's going to return some nice value. Uh, and so this is an example of, of user code that is really, really bad in some way. It's misbehaving. Then we're going to, once that result happens, we're going to save. 
So let's, let's run that. And so this load and pre-process stuff, that works just fine. Uh, but you'll notice that uh, the DAS workers are getting killed every once in a while. You can see those workers here. They keep dying and DAS keeps bringing them up. And you can see in the task stream, you know, new threads, new processes keep trying to process this data. But it's really hard, right? DASK is trying its hardest to compute this computation. But eventually it just realizes, look, some of these functions just aren't running. I've tried them many times on many different workers. They keep crashing stuff. I'm going to give up. And so this results in what's called uh, a killed worker error. And you may have gotten these before. Uh, it's not kind of an opaque error message, but it says that I've, Dask has tried to run your code, and for whatever reason, workers seem to die when, when your code is run. So we're just going to stop trying. And that's what's happened in this case. Dask has given up. So let's restart that, and let's go back to slides for a second to figure out how we can fix that. So again, similar case to what we saw, user code was, was killing the full process. And that means that the Dask code goes away, and that's really disruptive. So this is a challenge, right? This is a challenge to our model of, of a shared memory environment where the Dask code and the user code are running in the same process. In this particular case, that was a bad choice. We would have been better off with a PySpark-like model where they're separated. So the question is, can we achieve that model with Dask? Can we isolate user code into a separate process from where Dask code is running? The answer is yes, we can. Uh, by using some some abilities to kind of hack Dask. And this is going to be sort of the fun part of, of what we're going to do to play with. So again, we've got this model. We've got this sort of shared memory environment with this thread pool executor running your code inside threads inside the same process. We might alternatively want to use a process pool executor. This is a choice that we thought about in the original design of Dask, and we went against it because just threads are better for the PyData space. But in this particular case, Process, process probably would have been better. So can we make a DAS worker that has both a thread pool executor for all of our normal tasks and a separate process pool executor for these special kind of ugly tasks? If we did, and if something were to fail, that process would go away, but everything else would be fine, and we would just recreate that process. So we want this architecture. Can we build this? The answer is yes, we can, because Dask, uh, Dask is very hackable. This is one of the really nice things about Dask being a pure Python package is that we can use all the great tools inside of Python to extend Dask in nice ways. So what we're going to do is we're going to restart our cluster. And we're going to use uh, Dask worker plugins. So a worker plugin is a way to run a bit of code on all of your Dask workers uh, at a variety of, of, of occasions. So we're going to use it in a very simple way, just at startup. But you can actually run, run custom Python code at every event, at every task that arrives, or at every task that fails, or at every task that goes into memory. You can run custom code. Uh, the example that's in the doc string here is, is logging an error, uh, a special error, onto some special system uh, every time a task fails. We actually don't want to do that. We're going to do something way simpler. We're just going to create a new process pool executor when we start up the worker. So this is a, a very simple worker plugin, but it's nice knowing that work plugins exist, that you have this ability to run custom code at every event inside every worker. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a process pool executor. Uh, when I say executor, I mean something from the concurrent futures module. This is a standard library in Python, which is what we use internally for our thread pool. Uh, it's also the API that Dask Futures implements. Uh, so people may be familiar with it from if you're familiar with Dask Futures. I'm actually going to choose, so the concurrent futures module has a thread pool executor and a process pool executor. Uh, we usually use threads when I switch processes. I'm actually going to instead recommend a Loki, which is a more, more enhanced process pool executor. It fills the exact same API, but it has a few extra bells and whistles, which I appreciate. So instead of concurrent futures, I'm using Loki. And then whenever a worker gets set up, I'm going to um, make a new process pool executor with the same number of processes as my worker has threads. So if my workers have four threads, they're going to get four processes as well. Then I'm going to add that to the worker's executor's uh, collection, which uh, usually just contains you know, a thread pool executor and a couple of extra things. So. We're going to create that plugin and then register it with all of our workers. And we can go and check to see that that worked. 
being able to see what other kind of executors uh, we, we have. We've got an offload executor for some serialization stuff. We've got the default one for, for threads. We've got some special one for actors. And now there's this new executor for processes. So all of our workers now have this new process pool executor inside of them. And any new workers will also get that. The nice thing about worker plugins is that they get uh, very reliably sent to workers as they show up. And so now what we can do is we can use another DAS feature, annotations, uh, to annotate our scary function. So any code that's run within a DASK annotate uh, context manager uh, will get sort of annotated with some special metadata. This can be arbitrary metadata if you want to annotate your own tasks. There are also a few special keywords that you can use, uh, which are in the DASK annotate doc string if you want to look for them. Things we're going to play with, there's executor. And we're going to use the same name we used before, which was processes. And so now all of the tasks that were created within this context manager uh, will will use that special new uh, executor that we that we created. We're also because we know this function is a little bit uh, variable. We're going to use the retries keyword as well, and just say you can retry this all these functions a few times. So this is great. We're asking for most of our code to run normally in the thread pool executor. But some of our functions we want to offload to this special new uh, process pool executor that we've just created. So let's run that and see what happens. So again, all of our normal code is running uh, nicely in these threads, which is pretty, pretty typical. And then these, these other functions, these scary functions, are running in this other space up here. Right, and only those tasks are running up here. This is where all of our processes are, uh, while all of our normal code is running uh, as normally in, in processes, in, all right, in threads. And so this is really cool. We got to achieve actually a pretty advanced architecture. We're mixing threads and processes. We're sending only certain tasks to the process pool executor, uh, and everything is working smoothly. What's also nice is that we were able to accomplish this with only a few lines of code. Uh, you know, maybe you know six or seven if you add everything up together, and so we were able to uh, we we're able to achieve this different architecture of a Dask worker uh, using existing extension mechanisms inside of Dask. So uh, that's it again to sort of outline what we've learned today. We saw a particular problem with workers not being responsive because of some tricky user code that was not released in the Gil properly. We then built some intuition around how Dask workers work and how Dask workers combine both Dask code and user code in the same process. How that can be advantageous, but also challenging sometimes. We then learned about three technologies inside of Dask, custom executors, particular process pool executor, uh, task annotations, and worker plugins that allowed us to build a new architecture inside of Dask. If you want to learn more, I recommend looking at the Dask documentation. And in particular, inside of setup, uh, there's a nice uh, custom initialization uh, system, which includes a lot of uh, fun ways to, to build new plugins and new ways to customize your own Dask environment. So that's it. Thanks, everyone, for your time.